Good morning and welcome back to our Saturday morning Bible study, live stream Bible study from Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Menominee Falls in Germantown, Wisconsin. Certainly is a privilege to have you joining us this morning as we once again take up uh, the letter to the Hebrews after taking two weeks off. Two weeks ago was Holy Saturday and then last week we had taken off just for uh, Easter week. So we're, uh, by God's grace, going to head back into Hebrews chapter 4 uh, this morning. There is a link on our Facebook page. Uh, if you'd like to click the bit.ly link called uh, Hebrews Lesson 6, um, that'll pull up the lesson that we'll be looking at today. We're going to begin um, our new study beginning at verse 6, chapter 4, verse 6. We're going to spend the first few minutes of our class today reviewing the argument of the of the letter of the Hebrews up to this point, especially the first five verses of chapter four. Um, so that's kind of the, the plan for today. Um, but let's uh, begin our study of the word with prayer. So we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by your resurrection from the dead, you have won for us an eternal rest, a rest from the for, for the forgiveness of all of our sins a rest from having to earn our salvation ourselves in the perfect rest of our heavenly home. We ask that as we study your word this morning, that you would help our souls come to you and find the rest that only you can give, rest for our souls. We ask this in all things, in your holy name. Amen. Okay, so remember the letter to the Hebrews is written, we don't know who wrote it, but it seems to have been a Jewish person. We don't know exactly to whom it was written, but it seems to have been written by a Jewish person to Jewish believers. Okay, so they're, they're people who are raised Jewish, who are ethnically Jewish, but who have become Christian believers. So they were raised Jews, but they have come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, the fulfillment of Judaism. But they are undergoing great persecution from unbelieving Jews. So their fellow Jewish people, um, their fellow people, except that they are not Christians. They're, they're Jewish people who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And so they're persecuting these Christians who do believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And that persecution is becoming so fierce that the readers, the original audience of the letter of the Hebrews, is thinking about are on the verge of giving up their Christian faith and returning to Judaism. And so the whoever the inspired writer of Hebrews is, we don't know who it is, but whoever it is takes up his inspired pen and he writes this beautiful kind of masterful letter exposition of the Old Testament scriptures uh, to encourage the these Hebrew believers to stay firm in their faith, to stay faithful to Jesus, to not give up their Christian faith and go back to Judaism. And the way that he does that is by presenting Jesus as being superior to various aspects of the Old Testament law, the Old Testament sacrifices, um, and Old Testament people, Old Testament figures. So the theme for the letter to the Hebrews is that Jesus is superior, that Jesus is greater, and that we're going to go through one thing after another that Jesus is greater than. And again, the purpose of this is to show the these struggling Hebrew Christians, trying to help them see that if they were to give up their Christian faith to return to Judaism, they would be giving up something superior to go some to that which is inferior. They would be taking a step backward. Um, so that's why the letter of the Hebrews, the theme is that Christ is superior to anything that ancient Judaism has. And in the first chapter, the really the first chapter and the beginning of chapter two, um, Jesus, what is superior? Jesus is superior to the angels. Angels played a major a role in especially Second Temple Judaism, so that intertestamental period. Um, the angels became very important in apocalyptic literature. Uh, and, and so the writer of the Hebrews takes, um, takes angels first, and he says, angels, yeah, angels are great. Angels are powerful. Um, angels are God's servants. But 
Christ is the Son. Christ is the Son of God. Christ is the uh, um, is God Himself. And so, uh, why would you go? Why would you give up your faith in the Son, who is the Son of God, to go back to the servants of God, to go back to the angels? And then um, we he has an exposition of that um, where he talks about the. Um, the fact that Jesus has become a real human being. So this is where we get the um, citation of Psalm 8. And we talked about that at great length. Um, you made him a little lower than the angels. Uh, and yet now we see him crowned with glory. So Christ was made a human, a real human being to save real human beings. That uh, because of what Jesus did, we as his brothers and sisters in, in faith, we who believe in him, become brothers and sisters and fellow heirs with Christ. Um, and so we outrank the angels. Jesus didn't become an angel to save angels, but he did become a human being to save human beings. So that's the kind of the emphasis of the rest of chapter two, um, that because Jesus took on real flesh and blood, a real human nature, um, we who are connected to Jesus through faith have a vic the victory of Jesus, the victory that Jesus won. So that takes us through the end of chapter 2. In the beginning of chapter 3, um, now Jesus, now the writer of the Hebrews is going to hold up one of the great figures of the Old Testament. Um, the um, Not the father of God's Old Testament people, that would be Abraham, um, but the second great deliverer, the great deliverer of God's Old Testament people, and that would be Moses, the one who delivered them from slavery in Egypt. And so it's hard for us to overestimate the importance of Moses to Judaism. Um, it, he is, if there were a Mount Rushmore of Judaism, then Abraham would be first and then Moses would be second. So um, that's how important Moses is to ancient Judaism. And so, um, but the writer of the Hebrews is going to make this argument that as great as Moses is and as great as Moses was, Jesus is greater. And the argument goes something like this, that as faithful and humble as Moses was, he was only a servant in the household of God. But Jesus is the son over the household of God. So Moses was a servant in God's household. He served the people of God. But Christ is the son over the household of God. He is, the, he is the one who rules over the people of God. Um, and so uh, that's kind of the argument of, uh, of chapter 3, verses uh, 1 to 6. And then we enter into the section of the letter that we have been wrestling with the past couple of times that we've met. Um, it begins in uh, Hebrews 3, verse 7. And it goes all the way through chapter 4, verse 13. Okay, so that's this long section beginning at chapter 3, verse 7, going all the way through 4, 13. And having talked about Moses, the great deliverer of God's people, who raised God's people up from slavery in Egypt, Having talked about Moses, now the writer of the Hebrews is going to focus on the people that Moses led out of Egypt, the people that he led out of Egypt, the people that he raised from slavery. And that group of people we're going to call the wilderness generation, the, the people who were a part of the deliverance from, from Egypt, who walked through the Red Sea on dry ground, who went up to the promised land but did not go into the promised land because they were afraid of the people. And as a judgment against their fear, God causes them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. That's why they're called the wilderness generation, because they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Um, so the judgment because of their unbelief, because they refused to believe what God said about him going before them and giving them the victory in the promised land, the judgment that came against those people is that they wouldn't be able to enter into the promised land. They, um, they would, that whole generation would pass away in the 40 years of the wilderness, and it wouldn't be until the next generation, Joshua's generation, that they would enter into the promised land. Okay, so what the writer of the Hebrews is going to do is he's going to take this 
this idea of entering into the promised land. And he is going to relate it to the concept of rest. And the reason he's doing that is because the scripture that he is, um, that he is uh, really preaching on, but the, the, the text of scripture that he is expositing, that he is, um, that he's talking about so that he might apply it to his listeners is this Psalm 95. So what I'd like to do is um, to have a start uh, in chapter 3, verse 7, and we're just going to review um, what Psalm 95 says. And remember, what I want you to, to, what I want us to get at, what I want us to see is how the writer of the Hebrews is taking this idea of entering into the promised land, which because of their unbelief, the wilderness generation received a judgment that they could not enter that promised land. And I want you to see how the writer of the Hebrews connects that promise, entering into the promised land with the concept of rest. Okay, so this is uh, chapter 3, verse 7. So as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestor tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. This is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Okay, so what we have is this Reminder of the wilderness generation, a reminder of their unbelief, their trying and testing God, their refusal to believe his promises, and the judgment that comes against that wilderness generation because of their unbelief is that they're unable to enter the promised land. And in terms of Psalm 95, the, the meaning of that or the application for that that the writer of the Hebrews draws, he, he, he draws a parallel between not entering into the promised land and not entering into God's rest. Okay. Now the, again, um, again, let me just say, let me let me look ahead a little bit. Why is the writer of the Hebrews doing that? Why is the writer of the Hebrews connecting, not entering into the promised land with the theme of God's rest? There's really two reasons. First of all, he sees a scriptural warrant for doing that in Psalm 95. Okay, so Psalm 95 itself links together the idea of the, of the wilderness generation not entering the promised land with the wilderness generation not entering into God's rest. So that's Hebrews 3 verse 11. So God says, so I declared on, on my oath or in my anger, they shall not enter my rest. And in the context of the wilderness generation, that means they will not enter into the promised land. But the payoff for making this connection for the writer of the Hebrews is that he's going to apply it to his, his original readers, the, these people who are living thousands of years later, these Jewish believers who are thinking about giving up their Christian faith and returning to Judaism. And he wants to say, guys, um, you may not lose entering into the promised land because that uh, entering the promised land, that happened thousands of years ago at Joshua's generation. But Psalm 95 does apply to you in this sense, that if you give up your Christian faith and go back to Judaism, you will miss out on God's rest. You won't miss out in the same way the wilderness generation did, the way the wilderness generation missed out on God's rest is that they didn't get to enter the promised land. But if you, um, be, you believing Jews, if you give up your Christian faith and you go back to Judaism, you are not going to enter into God's rest. And the writer of the Hebrews is going to tell us explicitly what that rest is at the end of our section today. Okay. Um, so, uh, so we, um, so we have this, uh, this exposition of Psalm 95, and then we have um, this application beginning at verse 12. So this is chapter 3, verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, 
so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end, and as, as has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Okay, so there's this encouragement. Um, it's actually a warning first. Verse 12 is a warning. And then verse 13 and 14 is an encouragement to um, not pattern yourself after the wilderness generation, to not have the same kind of unbelief the wilderness generation had, but instead um, to have a believing heart um, a heart that trusts firmly in the, the promises of Jesus and holds on to those promises to the very end. In other words, don't give up your faith to go back to Judaism. And then in, in, uh, in the last paragraph before chapter 4, the writer um, uses this, um, this literary convention, or it's really a rhetorical convention, of, of rhetor what we call rhetorical questions. Um, and their their questions, tr technically speaking, a rhetorical question is a question whose answer is so obvious that it doesn't need to be given. Um, these particular rhetorical questions, actually, the writer of the Hebrews does give us the answer, just to make it absolutely clear um, what he's talking about. But what he um, this whole paragraph is aimed at helping us see that the wilderness generation did not enter into the God's rest by not entering the promised land. So we'll begin reading at verse 16. This is chapter 3, verse 16. Who were they who heard and rebelled? They were, um, were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? They were. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose body perished in the wilderness? And it was, right? So, um, so those who heard the gospel and rebelled were the wilderness generation. And those who heard and rebelled um, were the ones that God was angry with. And the way that you know he was angry with them is because they didn't enter the promised land. Their bodies um, died in the wilderness. They didn't enter the promised land. They died before they got to the promised land. Verse 18, And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. So now you got the right of the Hebrews. Now he's pulling out the big guns, right? Now we're talking about the difference between faith and unbelief, right? Now we have we have the right the wilderness generation is this group of people who have heard the gospel. They actually saw the gospel and this great deliverance from Egypt, the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. Right, the, the Red Sea parting, so they walked over on dry ground, and then that very same Red Sea swallowing up Pharaoh and his army. Um, this people who saw, who received manna and received manna every day in the morning and the evening, and um, that occasionally received quail from God as proof that he would be with them. Um, this group, of, this generation whose clothes and shoes did not wear out, even though they were wearing them for 40 years. So just over and over and over and over again, God showed his love and his caring concern and his forgiveness to this group of people. And yet over and over and over again, this group of people showed that they did not believe. They heard the gospel, but they did not believe it. And so God was angry with them and they didn't enter into the rest of God's promised land. Now, the application of the payoff for these Hebrew Christians is that they too have heard the gospel, and for a time they have believed the gospel. And now the Red Hebrew says, are you going to be so foolish as to make the same mistake your ancestors made? They heard the gospel, and they did not believe, and so they did not enter God's rest. You have heard the gospel. If you go back to Judaism, then you are going to not believe and you are not going to enter into God's rest. So there is this parallelism. There is this um, uh, this warning that the, these Hebrew Christians who are thinking about giving up their faith are running the danger, running them, are putting themselves in the danger of go, of making the same mistake their ancestors did, and and by and thereby robbing themselves of God's rest, like their ancestors did. 
learner's generation, they still have the chance to repent. And that, I guess, I don't know, yeah, is it a heightening? Yeah, so Rachel's question is, the, is the, the difference between the rest for God, for the wilderness generation, and the rest for the writer, to, for the original audience of the Hebrews, is there, is there a heightening or an ascension there? And there is. Okay, so we're talking about typology now. So typology takes an Old Testament person, thing, or event. In this case, it's the promised land. And it uses that to point ahead to a greater New Testament reality. Okay, so in this case, the greater New Testament reality is the forgiveness of sins that is enjoyed by those who have faith in Jesus. So you could be living in the promised land and not be a believer. And you could not be living in the promised land and be a believer. Living in the promised land really had nothing to do with whether or not you were right with God. But this idea of having enjoying the rest of living in the promised land as an Old Testament type of having the forgiveness of being right with God. That's the kind of argument the writer of the Hebrews is making in this chapter, in these chapters, in this section that begins at 3.7 and goes through 4.13. So there is, a, there is a sense of heightening. So what I don't want you to think, what I don't want you to think is that every person who died in the wilderness went to hell. Okay? Okay. That just because that generation didn't enter into the rest of God's promised land, that doesn't mean they didn't enter into the rest of the forgiveness of sins. They could have, and I'm cer I certainly imagine that there were those. I mean, I, I know there were because Moses was a part of that generation, right? Um, so I'm not saying that everybody who, who died in the wilderness generation, that that whole generation went to hell. But because of the heightening and the argument, that is the warning the writer of the Hebrews is giving to his original audience. If you make the same mistake your ancestors made, um, or let me say it this way, your ancestors made the mistake of not believing and that cost them living in the promised land. If you make the mistake of not believing, that means you don't get to enter in the promised land of heaven. You don't get to enter in the promised land of having the forgiveness of your sins. So that's why, that's the sense in which there's this heightening, there's this intensification between type and fulfillment, between shadow and reality. Okay? All right. So we've, we've, we've got this, we, we ended, we ended on this, um, this chapter three, we ended on this note, this kind of resounding, think about a gong has been rung. They did not enter because of their unbelief. Bam, right? Um, this, this, this tremendous close to the chapter um, that they were not able to enter God's rest because of their unbelief. And then chapter four, therefore, on, on the basis of this punch at the end of chapter 3, this punch in the gut, they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Therefore, on the basis of what has just been said, here's a conclusion that I want you to take to heart, okay? Whenever you see the word therefore, ask yourself, what is the therefore, therefore? Therefore, and now he's going to make, now he's going to draw the, he's going to let the other shoe fall. He's going to let the coin flip. So we see the other side of the coin. Um, because they did not enter the promised land because they, of their unbelief. Therefore, here's what you are to do, you, you um, Hebrew Christians. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, all these centuries later, even after God's people have entered into and then been kicked out of the promised land, okay, after all these centuries, the promise of entering his rest still stands. And since that's the case, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it, of God's rest. For, here's an explanation, here's, here's what it means to have fallen short. We also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. 
but the message they heard of was no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now, we who have believed enter that rest. Just as God has said, and now there's this weird quotation, um, so I declared on my oath they shall never enter my rest. It seems like that's making the opposite point of what the writer of the Hebrews was trying to argue. But remember, this is what we talked about three weeks ago, the last time we met, that this passage actually proves that there is still a rest to enter into. Um, so he declares on his oath, they shall not enter my rest. That means there is a rest that can be entered into. Okay, so um, we have believed, we who believe enter into that rest um, and uh, his works, God's works, have been finished since the creation of the world for somewhere, and this is the somewhere is in Genesis 2, um, for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, on the seventh day God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. So with that little paragraph, um, chapter um, chapter 4, beginning at verse 3c, and yet his works have been finished all the way through chapter 5, is just establishing that there still is a rest that we can enter into. There's still Well, there still is a rest that the original audience could enter into, but... Um, but that's the that promise of that rest still stands. So even 21st century Christians who I believe enter into that rest. So the so the writer of Hebrews says that rest that we enter into by believing, that rest began on the seventh day of creation, when God rested from all of His work. And it's a rest that Psalm 95 testifies to. So I swore on my anger they shall never enter my rest. Um, so what I, what I want us to see, the argument that he's making in this pair, this little paragraph or little half paragraph, is that the rest that we enter into is God's rest. Okay? It's, we enter into God's rest, the rest that he began on the seventh day. And what you notice is that verse 6, or we're going to pick up today, verse 6 begins with another, therefore. Okay? So since it is the case that God's rest has been, and this is really the therefore of therefores. This is really where he's going to bring the whole argument to a head. Okay, so really what, let's go back and we're going to say everything that he said, that this therefore hangs on everything that he said so far in this section beginning in chapter 3 verse 7. Okay, so he says, since it is the case that the wilderness generation did not believe, and because of their unbelief, they were not enter, they didn't were not able to enter into the lesser rest of God's Old Testament um, of the promised land. And since it is true that the promise of God's rest still stands today, here let this be the conclusion. Um, so let's go ahead and read. Um, so if, if we're if we're looking at our lesson now. The lesson that was posted in the Facebook feed, we're on page two, about halfway down page two, and it and the, and the heading says, read Hebrews 4, 6 to 11. That's what we're going to pick up today, okay? So here's Hebrews 4, verse 6. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For, explanation, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Okay, 
I know there's a lot going on in that paragraph, but it is the huge payoff. This is really where we get we get the big um, the big payoff of this whole section. So I have the question, continuing his inspired explanation and application of Psalm 95, the writer continues his discussion by helping us see that God's oath against the wilderness generation is to be understood as a promise for believers. So what I want to do, before we look at the questions that are in the lesson, beginning of verse 8, what I want to do is just talk us through each each almost each clause in this paragraph, um, certainly each verse, so that we understand how the argument is being advanced, okay? So chapter 4, verse 6, begins with a therefore. Therefore, since everything we've said so far in this letter, or this argument is true. Now, the next two paragraphs, the next two clauses, both begin with the word since, okay? Therefore, since, and then, and since, you see that in verse six, there are two since, since clause. You can really look at those two clauses as a summary of everything that's been said up to this point. So it's almost like what the writer of the Hebrews does is he says, therefore, on the basis of what I just said, and just in case you've forgotten, let me remind you of what I've just said. Those are the two since clauses. So here are the two things he said so far. The two big parts of his argument. Since uh, it re still remains for some to enter that rest, that'd be us. That'd be you, your original audience, and that'd be us today. And since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not enter because of their disobedience, that would be the wilderness generation. Okay, so those are the two parts of the argument so far. Um, the wilderness generation didn't enter, therefore it's important that we enter. God again set a certain day, calling it today. We're going to talk about this. Then we get to that in just a second. But we say, well, where does he get that from? That's the very beginning of the quotation from Psalm 95. If you let your eye go back to chapter 3, verse 7, the citation of Psalm 95 begins with the word today. So the rest that God invites us to enter into, the promise of that rest begins today. As long as it is called today, as long as we are still in today, the promise of God's Sabbath rest stands. Okay, that's the little, he's going to make that explicit here in a second. But that's the significance of that line. Um, God again, again set a later day calling it today. And he did this a long time later when he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. And then he quotes Psalm 95, the beginning of Psalm 95, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So now what the writer of the Hebrews is doing is he's making a temporal con comparison, a, 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 a comparison in time, okay? So he says, let's just think about this. The wilderness generation did not believe, and so they did not enter into the rest that was the promised land. But there obviously is a different kind of rest that God has in mind, because David wrote Psalm 95. And David lived a thousand years after, or uh, twenty five hundred years after the promised land, after the wilderness generation, the wilderness generation. I shouldn't say that. I should say a thousand or fourteen hundred years. Let me let me think about this for a second. Four hundred years. Okay. So wilderness generation. Think four fourteen hundred BC, um, fourteen forty probably fourteen forty BC. And then David is about 1,000 B.C. So there's about 400 years separating, four centuries that are separating the wilderness generation from David. Okay, now, perhaps that doesn't seem like a lot of time. You know, perhaps that between 1440 B.C. and 1,000 B.C. doesn't seem like a lot of time. But remember that America has only existed for like 250 years. Okay, we were formed in 1776, and it's 2020. So um, we're only about, I guess we're a little more than halfway. The entire history of America is a little more than halfway the distance between the wilderness generation and David. So I know I'm from, a, from a big 
from a big picture perspective, the difference between 1440 BC and 1000 BC doesn't seem like a lot of time. But in reality, it is a lot of time. It's over four centuries, right? So this wilderness generation didn't enter the promised land. They didn't enter into God's quote unquote rest because they didn't enter in the promised land. But then four centuries later, now you have David talking about entering into God's rest. So there must be another kind of rest. There must be a greater rest that God has in mind that isn't the promised land. Um, and so, and, and he's going to explain that in verse 8. Why is it that there is a greater rest that isn't the promised land? Well, for verse 8, if Joshua had given them the ultimate rest, if the promised land was the ultimate rest, then Joshua would have given that to them because Joshua is the one who led them into the promised land, right? For if Joshua had given them rest, then there would have been no need for God to have spoken later about another day. If God's ultimate rest is into the promised land, then why is David talking about rest? David is in the promised land, <laughs> right? David has David is is reaping the benefits of Joshua's work, and yet David is talking about another kind of rest, another day of rest, which he calls today. Well, obviously, none of the wilderness generation entered that rest because they're dead. And they've been dead for four centuries. Um, so, um, what does it mean to enter into that rest? There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their own works, just as God did from his. So that's what it means to enter into God's rest. It means to stop trying to get right with God on the basis of your works. It means stop doing good works. Not that he wants us to stop doing good works, but stop doing good works as the basis for how you get right with God, which is what the Judaism of the day of the original audience said. You have to do good works in order to be right with God. Where the Hebrew says, no, there's a Sabbath rest for the people of God that as long as it's called today, you cease from your own works. You cease from trying to get right with God on the basis of your own works. And you enter into the rest of God, the rest that began on the seventh day when he ceased his works. But just like God ceased from working, so too we enter God's rest by ceasing from doing good works or trying to get with God on the basis of good works. And then the big encouragement, verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following the example of disobedience. So here you have kind of a, a paradox, and but it's a really important paradox. It's really a paradox of law and gospel, a paradox between justification and sanctification. On the one hand, entering into God's rest means not working. It means not doing good works. Or not, I, I gotta stop saying that. Not thinking that your good works is what gets you right with God. God wants us to do good works. But the kind of rest that we're talking about here is the rest of thinking that by your good works, you get right with God. That you have to earn God's favor with good works. God says, no, no, no. I'm going to give you that rest. I'm going to give you the rest of the forgiveness of sins. You don't have to earn it. I'm going to give it to you. It's my rest. God says, it's the rest that I entered into on the seventh day when I stopped creating. It's, it's, that's why it's called God's rest and not our rest, because it's the rest that God earns. The way that we enter into God's rest is by, by ceasing to think that we earn our place in God's rest and just receiving God's rest as a free gift. But then verse 11, the Rebbe Hebrew says, but remember, that takes work. It takes work to enter into God's rest. It takes effort. Um, that's sanctification, right? It, um, entering into God's rest is a matter of justification. But that doesn't mean that we just sit back and do nothing. It means that we, it means that we take seriously the call to faith. And we make every effort to be found in that true faith. Which going back to the whole situation, that's what the Hebrew Christians are thinking about giving up. They're thinking about giving up their faith. 
Okay, so what I want to do, we've been going for 40 minutes now. What I want to do is give you the chance to ask any questions you have about, well, actually, I take that back. Let's work through the questions in the lesson um, for this for this paragraph, verses 6 to 11. And then I'm going to give you a second to ask any questions you have about this paragraph, okay? So we're going to look in the lesson, we're going to look at question number 8. What day has God set as the opportunity to enter into his rest? And that day is today. Today is the chance that God has given to enter into God's rest, to enter his rest today. Now, when the writer of the Hebrews penned that word today, right? And he, and he, and he, had, that, he had that word and he sent this letter to the Hebrew Christians. What he's trying to tell the Hebrew Christians is, look, the time for you to believe in the gospel is today. Today is the chance for you to believe. It uh, We can't say, oh, I'll, I'll believe in God tomorrow. I'll worry about spiritual things tomorrow. No, no, no. You may not get it tomorrow. Today is the day to believe. Today is the day to take God seriously. Today is the day to enter into God's rest. Nobody's guaranteed a tomorrow. So we got to go in today. Okay. But um, so that was the today when, when he writes the letter, when he sends the letter to the Hebrew Christians, that the day they receive this letter, the day that is their today. Our today is this day. Our today is today, this Saturday. Um, this is the day that we have to enter into God's rest. The right of the Hebrews would have us not wait until tomorrow. Well, you know, tomorrow is is worship. So I'll, I will, I'll, I'll worry about entering God's rest on Sunday when we have worship. But today, I'm going to live like a pagan. I'm going to live like a heathen. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to act like there's no such thing as faith. The right of the Hebrews says, don't do that. Don't make that stupid mistake. That's essentially the mistake of the wilderness generation. They did not believe. They did not obey. Don't make that mistake. Because the only day that you and I are promised is today. Enter into God's rest today. Because that's the only day that you and I have to repent and believe. Now, the follow-up question is, why is this a great comfort? Why is this a great comfort? that we have today as the opportunity to enter into God's rest. Well, it's a great comfort because you and I don't deserve the opportunity of today. Because think about how we messed it up yesterday, and then the day before that, and the day before that, and the day before that, and so on and so on and so on and so on, right? Um, really, what our entire lives are a testimony that we make the same mistake the wilderness generation made. That because of our disobedience, because of our sinfulness, because of our disobedience, we show just how weak our faith really is. We do not deserve to enter into God's rest. If God gave us what we deserve, he would withhold his rest from us. He'd say, fine, you want to disobey? You want to have a weak faith? Then forget it. I'm not going to give you rest. But that's not the kind of God we have. We don't have a God who withholds. He doesn't, we don't have a God who treats us as we deserve. We don't have a God who withholds his rest because of our unfaithfulness. Because the rest that he holds out is not based on our unfaithfulness, but on his faithfulness. And so we have elsewhere in the Bible, I believe it's a psalm, but it may not be a psalm. It may be Lamentations. Um, Your mercies are new every morning. As long as you and I wake up today, as long as we are alive for today, today is an opportunity to believe. Okay? Today is an opportunity under God's... That's a great comfort. Yeah, you and I may have screwed it up yesterday, but we get it today. Okay? Um, so today is the day to enter into God's rest. Rachel is desperately searching to see if she can find where your mercies are new every morning comes from. I'm pretty sure it's like Jeremiah. Could be a book. Yeah, um, it's not in the little concordance that we have in the Bible we're using. Um, 
Okay, so let me make the second half of the argument. Lamentations 3. Lamentations 3. So your mercies in every morning. I said it was either Psalms or Lamentations, right? So <laughs> I was hedging my bets there, and I was I was right, or at least I was half right. It is in um, Lamentations. Your mercies are new every morning. For some reason, I had that tucked away as a psalm in my head. But then every time I, so I, I, I quote it, I'm supposed to remind myself it's not a psalm. It's from Lamentations. It sounds very psalm-like. It is, it is psalm-like. Yeah. Um, probably in a psalm somewhere. So, but anyway, so that's the comfort. The comfort of, of today. The comfort that there is still a day today. That God let you wake up today means that God has given you another day to repent, another day to repent and believe. Today is the day that God invites you to enter into his rest. And as long as you are alive today, you have that opportunity. That's the comfort. Okay. But it's also a warning. When the writer of the Hebrews says, as long as it is today, do not harden your hearts. Because the reality is, you this, this today may be your last today. In other words, if you don't take God up on his opportunity to enter into his rest today, you may not get another today. If today is the day to enter into his rest, then you better do it today. Because you might not get a today tomorrow. Certainly hope you do, right? Um, but, uh, or I hope that I, maybe I'll just make it personal. I hope that I do. I hope that if, when I screw it up today, not if, but when I screw it up today, that I have another today, tomorrow, right? But the time to repent and believe is right now. Because because none of us are guaranteed to a chance to do it later. Now, what I want you to think about is how a strong warning that would have been to the writer's original audience. Um, here's the urgency of you not giving up your Christian faith. Today, you are to repent and believe. Today, you are to keep hold of your Christian faith. Today is the day to not give up. Because if you, what happens if you give up your faith today and then you don't get it tomorrow? Think about how tragic that would be. So it's a beautiful promise. As long as there's a today, you have a chance to repent and believe. So that means that all of us have the chance to repent and believe because we all have it today. But it's a warning to make sure that you do repent and believe today because you might not get another one. You might not get it tomorrow. So law, gospel, justification, sanctification, right? Um, great promise, great comfort, great warning. All right, and then number nine um, the, uh, sorry, not question number nine, which has to do with Hebrews chapter four, verse nine, where the Hebrews continues, um, uh, calls this continuing rest that God offers today as a Sabbath rest for the people of God. According to Hebrews 4, 10, what is this rest all about? <clears throat> um, there are four passages that are listed there. Three of those passages are really famous. Um, so, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that I shouldn't say, okay? I'm going to say something that I shouldn't say. So you remember, just tuck this away. Pastor, you shouldn't say that. But you should know Matthew 11, 28, John 19, 30, and Ephesians 2, 8, 9 off the top of your head, okay? So if, you, if there's one of those passages that you don't know off the top of your head, then what I want you to do is make it your goal this week that you know what those three passages are off the top of your head. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 is where Jesus says, um, Come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Okay? So in that passage, Jesus is the one who's offering rest. Come to me, you who are weary and burdened, I will give, I will give you rest. Um, John nineteen thirty is where Jesus says, It is finished. The work of salvation done it's finished there's no more work left to do because jesus has done all the work of salvation and then ephesians 2 8 9 is we have it is by grace we you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves it is the gift of god not by works so no one can boast um right so that's for it is by grace you've been saved and what i want you to notice about that passage is the past tense 
It is by grace that you have been saved. It's a perfect tense even. Right? It, you have been saved. It's done. You're, the work of your salvation is over. There's no more work to do. You have been saved. Past tense. But if you don't know Isaiah 59, 16, and 17 off the top of your head, that's okay. Um, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect you to have that, to know that off the top of your head. So that is the one I'm going to read to you. Um, so Isaiah 59, beginning of uh, 16 and 17. And this is what Isaiah says. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. Now, the word justice um, car carries the terms, the overtones of righteousness. Um, so um, I'd have to go back and see if that's mishpat or if it's um, exactly what the Hebrew word is being used there. But the Lord looked and was displeased. There was no right. There was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled. There was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. This passage says God looked around at who was going to win salvation for the world. And he didn't see anybody who could do it, so he did it. So his own arm worked salvation. So when you look at these four passages, what they all emphasize is that the work of our salvation is already an accomplished fact. And it's already an accomplished fact and that it was won by God. It is the fact that salvation is completed, that all the work of winning our salvation is done and is over. There's no need for us to do any more work because Jesus did all the work, because God did all the work. It is finished. Come to me who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest, Jesus says, because he is the guy He's the God whose arm works salvation for him. And it is by grace you have been saved, past tense. So when you look at Hebrews 4.10, what does it mean to enter into the Sabbath rest of God? It means resting from your own works. It means giving up on this idea that you have to earn your forgiveness. Rachel. A question and then a comment from Okay. Yeah, so so Kyle's question is, what does a Catholic say about Romans about he, Ephesians two eight nine? So first of all, I'd say, I consider Ephesians two eight nine to be what is what I call the Catholic Buster, capital C capital B, um, the Catholic Buster. In other words, um, Ephesians two eight nine is the most powerful biblical argument against Roman Catholicism. All right, let's just say that, right? Um, however, what the Roman Catholics do about that is they'll say something like Jesus finished or Jesus, um, Jesus did the work of redeeming us on the cross. And now we make that work ours by doing good works. Okay. That we do good. We make the works of Jesus ours by doing good works. In other words, what I, what I want you to see what Roman Catholics do is they incorporate sanctification into justification. The way that they get right with God is by believing and by doing good works, both together. Whereas what a Lutheran says is the way you get right with God is by believing alone. Faith alone. It's just by believing. Good works come later. They're a whole nother deal. They're a whole they're a whole nother thing. They follow justification. They flow from justification. They um, are our response to justification. But good works have no part to play in justification. Though they're two separate deals. But what a Roman Catholic is going to say is, no, if you want to be justified, you have to do good works. Good works play in there a part of justification. Okay, so so the um when, when you're when you're working with Catholics or when you're you know sharing your faith with Catholics, 
and you get to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and that's where you want to get to. You want to get to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, because that's the Catholic buster, right? But you, um, what you want to emphasize is, first of all, the past tense, the perfect tense of you have been saved. You have been saved. It's done. It's over. You don't, you don't have to do it anymore. In fact, you don't even have to do it all because it's not only is it done, not only is it past, it's also passive. You have been saved. You don't save yourself. Somebody else saves you. You have been saved. So it's past and passive. It's actually what we call a perfect passive verb. Um, so you have been saved. That's the first thing I want to emphasize with them. Look, your good works don't factor into how you're saved. You're already saved. But then the next phrase, how is it that you're saved? By faith. And what does the apostle mean when he says by faith? Not by works. That's what makes it the Catholic buster. Is that the Rome is that Ephesians 2:8-9 specifically contrasts faith with works. So, if you take Ephesians 2:8, you know, seriously. If you take 2:8-9 seriously, if, if, you, if you let Paul say what Paul is saying, then Roman Catholicism cannot stand up to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So what they have to do is they have to reinterpret Ephesians 2, 8, 9 to fit into their theology of works. Okay, so that's the question. What's the comment? The comment is, oh, he just had in the repent today section. Repent now because who knows what will happen with all this corona yeah, right. Uh, I think um, so. Kyle's comment is about uh, our own situation that we live in today is a reminder of why it's important to repent today. Right. Um, we certainly don't want to overplay the seriousness of coronavirus because it seems like a lot of the data that's coming out is that it's maybe not as serious as it was at first maybe we were led to believe but um but what if if nothing what coronavirus has or what covid-19 has helped us remember has brought to our attention in a way that that is very easy to forget in the normal path of life is is that we are mortal right um that that our lives could end at any time yeah it could be covid-19 that kills you or it could be that you step in front of a bus tomorrow or it could just be totally random. It could just be some kind of totally random thing that um, that uh, uh, a blood clot goes to your lungs or something like that. And, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, your earthly life comes to an end. None of us are guaranteed a tomorrow. So maybe one of the good things that COVID-19 does is it reminds us of our mortality. It reminds us that just how fragile life really is. And that's why it's so important for us to believe now and today, right? It's so important because uh, we may not get it tomorrow. Today is the day to repent. And today is the day to believe because you might not get it tomorrow. And I think you can, you can take that and very easily answer the last two questions for number 10. Why was that such a powerful reminder for the original audience? Well, because they were kind of taking tomorrow for granted, right? And when they when they were thinking about giving up their Christian faith and going back to Judaism, they were putting their eternal lives at risk because they might not have had a tomorrow. They might not have had a chance to make up for that mistake, to, to go back to their Christian faith. You go back to Judaism today, and today is your last day then you're not going to go to heaven. Those are the stakes, right? And the second paragraph is, how is it a thoroughly appropriate application for us? In the exact same way. You give up um, believing today. You make today not a day to repent and believe. And then you don't get it tomorrow. You don't go to heaven. You, don't, you, you end up going to hell. So the time to repent and believe is today, is right now. And that is the big application of this whole long, drawn-out, complicated, God's rest, Old Testament wilderness generation, um, that the whole, this whole thing, 
the big takeaway is make sure that you believe today. Okay, we're out of time. Um, what, we, what we'll do, God willing, next week when we meet is we'll finish this section up. Um, this sec Remember, this section started in 3 verse 7, and it goes through 4 13. So we just have 12 and 13 that we got to finish. And then we're going to launch into chapter th uh, 4 verse 14. And this is when the letter starts to get super fun. Um, because now we're going to talk about the high priesthood of Jesus. And we're going to get to talk about an old, an important Old Testament figure, Melchizedek. And Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek. So, if you want to kind of work ahead a little bit, if you want to think a little bit about where we're going to go, then this week, in addition to making sure that you know um, he, uh, Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, John 19, 30, and Ephesians 2, 8, 9, on addition to that, spend some time reading the first few verses of Psalm 110. This Psalm 110, we're going to go from Psalm 95. Now we're going to go to Psalm 110. Okay. But let's close with the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen. Thank you very much. God willing, see you soon.